Putney Theatre Company presents an adaptation of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 4 Soon after Joe returned home from New York, Laurie left for Europe. Neither the Marches or Mr. Lawrence asked precisely why the two barely spoke before Laurie's departure. When Laurie was gone, Joe proposed a trip to the beach for her and Beth. For since she had returned, she was shocked to see how much worse Beth had got. It came to her then, more bitterly than ever, that Beth was slowly drifting away from her. Her arms instinctively tightened their hold upon the dearest treasure she possessed. Joe, dear, I'm glad you know it. I've tried to tell you, but I couldn't. Beth, I... I've known it for a good while, dear. And now I'm used to it. It isn't hard to think of or to bear. Try to see it so, and don't be troubled about me. Because it's best. Indeed it is. Oh, Beth. And you didn't tell me, didn't let me comfort and help you? How could you shut me out and bear it all alone? Perhaps it was wrong. But I tried to do right. It would have been selfish to frighten you all. Oh, Beth... You must get well. I want to. Oh, so much. I try. But every day I lose a little and feel more sure that I shall never gain it back. It's like the tide, Joe. When it turns, it goes slowly, but it can't be stopped. It shall be stopped. Your tide must not turn so soon. Nineteen is too young, Beth. My life has been sweeter than I could wish for. But I'm glad to go. You'll tell them this when we go home? I think they will see it. If they don't see it, you will tell them for me. I don't want any secrets, and it's kinder to prepare them. Meg has John and the babies to comfort her. But you must stand by father and mother, won't you, Joe? If I can. But, Beth, I don't give up yet. I'm going to believe that... It is a sick fancy and not let you think it's true. I don't know how to express myself. I only mean to say that I have a feeling that it never was intended I should live long. I'm not like the rest of you. I never wanted to go away. And the hard part now is leaving you all. I'm not afraid. But it seems as if I should be homesick for you even in heaven. Joe leaned down to kiss the tranquil face, and with that silent kiss, she dedicated herself, soul and body, to Beth. She was right. There was no need of any words when they got home, for father and mother saw plainly now what they had prayed to be saved from seeing. I'm so tired from travelling. Let me help you to bed, dear girl. You can tell me all about your trip. She doesn't want to fight anymore. Joe. You have to talk to her, Marmy. Convince her she could get better. I won't lie to her, Joe. We can't give up on her. We're not giving up. No one should have to live their life in pain, Joe. At three o'clock in the afternoon, all the fashionable world at Nice may be seen on the Promenade d'Anglais, which is bounded on one side by the sea, and on the other by a grand drive lined with hotels and villas. Beyond lies orange orchards in the hills. Along this walk on Christmas Day, a tall young man walked slowly with his hands behind him and a somewhat absent expression of countenance. Laurie! Amy March, young women do not holler down the street. Stop the carriage! Oh, please, Aunt March, please, it's Laurie! You know, I don't like that Lawrence boy. You liked him when you were dancing with him at Meg's wedding. Amy! Oh, please, Aunt March, it's Laurie and it's Christmas! Very well. Can I come too? You don't even know the boy. I could get to know him. Lawrence Carroll, sit down this instant. I'll see you back at the hotel. Don't forget to leave enough time to get ready! Amy March! I can't believe it's really you! What took you so long? I was detained. 
but I promised to spend Christmas with you, and here I am. I have so much to say I don't know where to begin. Walk with me back to the hotel. I must get back in time to get ready for tonight. What happens then? A ball? A Christmas party at our hotel. There are many Americans there, and they give it in honor of the day. You'll go with us, of course. Aunt will be charmed. I doubt that, somehow. But I would be honored to come with you. Now tell me about yourself. The last I heard of you, your grandfather wrote that he expected you from Berlin. Yes, I spent a month there, and then joined him in Paris, where he is settled for the winter. He has friends there and finds plenty to amuse him, so I go and come and we get on capitally. Amy watched him, and felt a new sort of shyness still over her, for he was changed and she could not find the merry-faced boy she left in the moody-looking man beside her. He was handsomer than ever, but he looked tired and spiritless. Not sick, nor exactly unhappy, but older and graver than a year or two of prosperous life should have made him. She couldn't understand it, and did not venture to ask questions. Have you heard about Beth? No. I haven't heard much from back home. Oh, I thought Joe would have told you. Beth's very sick. I often think I ought to go home, but they all say stay. So I do, for I shall never have another chance like this. I think you're right there. You could do nothing at home, and it is a great comfort to them to know that you are well and happy and enjoying so much. Look at that view. Wouldn't Joe just die for it? Yes. Take a good look at it for her sake, and then come and tell me what you've been doing with yourself all this while. Amy prepared herself for a good talk, but she did not get it. For though he answered all her questions freely, she could only learn that he had roved about the continent and been to Greece. So after idling away an hour, they made their way to the hotel, and having paid his respects to Aunt March, Laurie left them. Promising to return in the evening. What are you going to wear? Can I wear your white silk? What, my old one? I just want something simple. And I suppose it doesn't hurt that you look stunning in white? I just want Lori to think I look well and tell them so at home. Oh, you want Lori to think you look well so you can tell them at home. You needn't repeat me word for word. Well, if you're going to be wearing an old dress, at least do something fashionable with your hair. I know it's not the fashion, but I'm just going to put it up in a knot. It's becoming, and I can't afford to make a fright of myself. Oh, no, really? Not a little frizzle or puff? You could at least do a braid. My new fan just matches my flowers. My gloves fit to a charm, and the real lace on Anne's handkerchief gives an air to my whole dress. If I only had a classical nose and mouth, I should be perfectly happy. Any young girl can imagine Amy's state of mind when she arrived at the ball that night, leaning on Laurie's arm. She... You, she looked well, and she loved to dance. With the first burst of the band, Amy's color rose, her eyes began to sparkle, and her feet to tap the floor impatiently, for she danced well and wanted Laurie to know it. Do you care to dance? <laughs> One usually does at a ball. I meant now. May I have the honor of the first dance? I can give you one if I put off the count. He dances divinely, but he will excuse me as you are an old friend. Nice boy, but rather short for you, I would have thought. But if he's the one to dance with, I won't keep you. Miss Carroll, would you care to dance? Mr. Lawrence, I thought you'd be dancing with Amy. She is otherwise engaged, I believe. Well, then I'd be delighted. That was unpardonable, and Amy took no more notice of him for a long while. Except a word now and then when she came to her chaperone between the dances for a necessary pin or a moment's rest. Her anger had a good effect, however, for she hid it under a smiling face and seemed unusually blithe and brilliant. Laurie's eyes followed her with pleasure, for she neither romped nor sauntered, but danced with spirit and grace, making the delightsome pastime what it should be. As she finally took a rest, Laurie rose to give her his seat, and when he hurried away to bring her some supper, she waited with a satisfied smile. Where did you learn all this sort of thing? As this sort of thing is rather a vague expression, would you kindly explain? Well, the general air, the style, the self-possession, 
They stress, you know. Foreign life polishes one in spite of oneself. I study as well as play, and as for this, it's an old dress of Florence's. The flowers were to be had for nothing, and I am used to making the most of my poor little things. Amy did not know why he looked at her so kindly, nor why he filled up her book with his own name, and devoted himself to her for the rest of the evening in the most delightful manner. But the impulse that wrought this agreeable change was the result of one of the new impressions which both of them were unconsciously giving and receiving. I believe the Vaughns have arrived in Nice. Amy, did you hear that? The Vaughns are arriving in Nice. I'm sitting next to you, Florence. Yes, I heard. Well, that means Fred will be back. I would assume so. You should organize a day trip. We've been wanting to go to Monaco. You've been wanting to go. Aunt Marge, could we go? I think it sounds like a delightful plan. Amy, you should invite the Vaughns. I'll send an invitation to Laurie as well. Oh, no. I don't think so. Laurie went to Nice, intending to stay a week, and remained a month. Amy and Laurie naturally took comfort in each other's society, and were always together. But while apparently amusing themselves in the most careless fashion, they were half-consciously making discoveries and forming opinions about each other. Amy rose daily in the estimations of her friend, but he sank in hers. Laurie made no effort of any kind, but just let himself drift along as comfortably as possible. He rather dreaded the keen blue eyes that seemed to watch him with such half-sorrowful, half-scornful surprise. Kate, Fred, it's so good to see you. It's so good to be back in France. London is positively frightful this time of year. Isn't Amy joining us? Yes, of course. Amy! Amy! Florence, don't holler. I wasn't... Hello, Fred. Amy, you look radiant. That's very kind of you. Kate, so nice to see you. Amy, what a sweet dress. I believe I've seen it on you before. Last year, wasn't it? Probably. Oh, well. It kept surprisingly well. I'm afraid I won't be able to join you on the trip today. What? What? I've really fallen behind with my drawing and I must get some painting done today. I'll be finished by the time you return and then we can all have tea together. Who's going to care if you don't finish some drawings? I'll care. But Amy, it's been so long since we've seen each other. I know, and I'm so sorry. It just can't be helped. Well, I guess we'll see you later on. I'll be waiting to hear all about your adventures. I'll bring you back a present. There was truth to Amy's claim about being behind with her drawing, but there was also a nagging voice which told Amy it wasn't proper to be seen spending so much time with Laurie and then go to Monaco on the arm of Fred Vaughan. She made her way to a monastery she had been keen to paint. Gnarled olive trees covered the hills with their dusky foliage, Fruit hung golden in the orchard, and great scarlet anemones fringed the roadside, while beyond, green slopes and craggy heights rose sharp and white against the blue Italian sky. Hello there. What on earth are you doing here? I came to find you at the hotel, but they said you'd come here. Well, wasn't that helpful of them? Apparently you didn't go to Monaco with the rest of your group. I didn't realize the hotel staff were so liberal with other people's itineraries. You almost seem annoyed I came. Not annoyed, no, just... Well? If you're going to be here, you have to be a quiet boy and let me work. My lips are sealed. Amy set up her easel and, although Laurie kept his promise and lay on the grass behind her not making a sound, the paint wouldn't work with her brush the way it normally would. The whole picture seemed flat and barely hinted at the beauty of the landscape she observed. Laurie, when are you going to your grandfather? Very soon. You have said that a dozen times within the last three weeks. I dare say short answers save trouble. He expects you and you really ought to go. I know. Then why don't you do it? Natural depravity, I suppose. Natural indolence, you mean? It's really dreadful. Not so bad as it seems, for I should only plague him if I went. So I might as well stay and plague you a little longer. You can bear it better. In fact, I think it agrees with you excellently. What are you doing just now? Watching lizards. No, no, I mean what do you intend and wish to do? Smoke a cigarette, if you'll allow me. Oh, there's no talking to you when you're like this. I'm sorry. 
I'll behave. When do you begin your great work of art, Raffaella? Never. Rome took all the vanity out of me, for after seeing the wonders there, I felt too insignificant to live and gave up all my foolish hopes in despair. Well, why should you? With so much energy and talent. That's just why, because talent isn't genius, and no amount of energy can make it so. I want to be great or nothing. I won't be a commonplace dauber, so I don't intend to try any more. And what are you going to do with yourself now, if I may ask? Polish up my other talents, and be an ornament to society if I get the chance. I suppose that's where Fred Vaughn comes in? I won't dignify that with an answer. Ah, but your face will, if your tongue won't. You aren't woman of the world enough yet to hide your feelings, my dear. I heard rumors about Fred and you last year. That's not for me to say. You are not engaged, I hope. No. But you will be, if he goes properly down on his knee, won't you? Very likely. Then you're fond of old Fred. I could be if I tried. I understand. Queens of society can't get on without money, so you mean to make a good match and start in that way. Quite right and proper, as the world goes, but it sounds odd from the lips of one of your mother's girls. Do you want to know what I honestly think of you? Pining to be told. Well, I despise you. Why, if you please? Because with every chance for being good, useful, and happy, you are faulty, lazy, and miserable. Oh, do tell me more. This is interesting stuff. I thought you'd find it so. Selfish people always like to talk about themselves. <laughs> Am I selfish? Yes, very selfish. I'll show you how, for I've studied you while we were frolicking, and I'm not at all satisfied with you. Here you have been abroad nearly six months, and done nothing but waste time and money and disappoint your friends. You said now much I'd improved since college. Now I take it all back, for I don't think you half so nice as when I left you at home. You have grown abominably lazy. You like gossip and waste time on frivolous things. You are contented to be petted and admired by silly people, instead of being loved and respected by wise ones. I can't help saying it. With all these splendid things to use and enjoy, you can find nothing to do but dawdle. And instead of being the man you ought to be, you are only... Say it. An insignificant bore. It's a shame we can't all be as saintly as the Great March sisters. <laughs> I supposed you'd take it so. You men tell us we are angels, but the instant we honestly try to do good, you laugh at us and won't listen, which proves how much your flattery is worth. Amy returned to her painting, her cheeks flushed with anger and disappointment. In a minute, a hand settled over hers so that she could not draw. I will be good. Oh, I will be good. Aren't you ashamed of a hand like that? It looks as if it never did a day's work in its life. Don't walk away from me. Teddy, I'm talking to you. Don't. Don't call me that. That's her name for me. And in an instant, Amy saw why Laurie had changed so. Why he never spoke of Joe without being prompted. And even then in monosyllabic answers. Amy's heart broke for the dejected man before her and for her sister at home who she knew would never have wanted to hurt her best friend like this. Do you think Joe would despise me as you do? Yes, if she saw you now. She hates lazy people. But I don't despise you, Lori. I love you with all my heart. heard the annoying tones of that young Lawrence boy recently. It's strange, isn't it? Ever since Mr. Vaughan came to Nice, we haven't seen Mr. Lawrence. Don't confuse coincidence with gossip, Florence. Amy, don't be so rude. Maybe you shouldn't be so nosy. Girls, I will not have you bicker. I did not bring you on this trip to hear your idle chatter. A note has been left for Miss March. A love letter, no doubt. If you're so interested, you read Why it. Why would I... Please, read it out loud. I have nothing to hide. I didn't... Just read it, Florence, so this ordeal can be over. Saint Amy, please make my goodbyes to your aunt and cousin, and congratulate yourself. 
for I have gone to see Grandpa like the best of boys. A pleasant winter to you, and may the gods grant you a blissful honeymoon at Valrosa. I think Fred would be benefited by a rouser. Tell him so, with my congratulations. Yours, gratefully, Laurie. There is an answer to your question, Aunt. I'm glad he's gone. Amy breezed out of the room, to the confusion of both her cousin and her aunt. But as soon as she had left, her face fell, and she gave out an involuntary sigh. Yes, I am glad, but how I shall miss him. Oh, Beth, you have meant more to me than anything in the world. Then I don't feel as if I'd wasted my life. I'm not so good as you make me out to be, but I have tried to do right. And now, when it's too late to begin even to do better, it's such a comfort to know that someone loves me so much and feels as if I'd help them. More than anyone in the world, Beth. I used to think I couldn't let you go. But I'm learning to feel that I don't lose you. That you'll be more to me than ever. And death can't part us, though it seems to. I know it cannot. And I don't fear it any longer. For I'm sure I shall be your Beth still, to love and help you more than ever. Remember that I don't forget you and that you'll be happier in doing that than writing splendid books or seeing all the world. The love is the only thing that we can carry with us when we go. And it makes the end so easy. I'll try, Beth. Seldom, except in books, do the dying utter memorable words. And those who have sped many parting souls know that to most... The end comes as naturally and as simply as sleep. As Beth had hoped, the tide went out easily, and in the dark hour before dawn, on the bosom where she had drawn her first breath, she quietly drew her last, with no farewell, but one loving look, one little sigh. Oh, I must have fallen asleep. How did Beth sleep? Oh, Joe. Army? I... I've got you, Mommy. I've got you. She's gone, Joe. But I didn't say goodbye. The room was very still, but a bird sang blithely on a budding bough close by. The snowdrops blossomed freshly at the window, and the spring sunshine streamed in like a benediction over the placid face upon the pillow. A face so full of painless peace that those who loved it best smiled through their tears and thanked God that Beth was in peace at last. That the task of forgetting his love for Joe would absorb all his powers for years. But to his great surprise, he discovered it grew easier every day. He refused to believe it at first, got angry with himself and couldn't understand it. But these hearts of ours are curious and contrary things. The wound persisted in healing with a rapidity that astonished him. And instead of trying to forget Joe, he found himself trying to remember his time in Nice with Amy. Mr. Vaughan, how pleasant to see you again. Likewise, Mrs. March. But this call is slightly different to my usual social call. Oh, really? Given Mr. March isn't travelling with Amy, I thought I would come to you to ask permission to ask for Amy's hand in marriage. Well... I can certainly let you put the question to Amy herself, 
although you would of course have to ask Mr. Marsh, regardless of her answer. That would be a most agreeable proposal. Very well. Estelle, can you get Miss Marsh? Of course. Oh, I didn't mean now. No, why ever not? Well, it's not very, uh, you know, the setting I'm isn't... I'm not certain what words you're trying to get out, Mr. Vaughan, but I would have thought you'd want an answer as soon as possible. Here's Miss March. Ah, Amy. Mr. Vaughan has a question for you. Oh, how romantic. Thank you, Estelle. You're welcome. I'll just be here in case you need anything. I won't. You might. Fred, what can I help you with? Well, you see, I wasn't really prepared for this, so I... Uh... <laughs> Don't mind them. Just say what's on your mind. Right. Yes. So, I was wondering if you would do me the honour of becoming my wife. That is to say, Amy, will you marry me? No, thank you. Oh, jolly. Sorry. I beg your pardon. I am so moved by your offer, Mr. Vaughan, but I'm afraid my answer has to politely be no. Oh. I... Estelle, please see Mr. Vaughan to the door. Of course. Please do call on us again, Mr. Vaughan. Florence will be sad she missed you. She'll certainly be sad she missed this. Goodbye, Mr. Vaughan. Goodbye, Miss March. You are a stupid and foolish girl. I'm sure I am, but there it is. You are poor and have little to no standing in society. What on earth possessed you to turn down an offer of marriage from a family with such wealth, such standing? There is something more than money and position needed to satisfy my heart. For all my newly learnt society ways, my heart is still full of tender hopes and fears. What nonsense. All I can say, Aunt, is I don't care to be queen of society now half as much as I do to be a lovable woman. Oh. You sound like your mother. What a pity. I thought this trip would curb you of that. But maybe you're destined to be a poor church mouse like your mother and your sisters. Perhaps. Amy and Laurie both got news of Beth's death at the same time. And although in different countries, they both knew that only one person could help heal their heavy hearts. Amy sat in the garden, leaning her head on her hand with a homesick heart and heavy eyes thinking of Beth and wondering why Laurie did not come. She did not hear him cross the courtyard beyond. If he had any doubts about the reception she would give him, they were set at rest the minute she looked up and saw him. Oh, Laurie! Laurie, I knew you'd come to me! I came the minute I heard. I wish I could say something to comfort you for the loss of dear little Beth, but I can only feel... And... You needn't say anything. This comforts me. Beth is happy now, and I mustn't wish her back, but I dread the going home, much as I long to see them all. We won't talk about it now, for it makes me cry, and I want to enjoy you while you stay. You needn't go right back, need you? Not if you want me, dear. I do, so much. Aunt and Flo are very kind, but you know me best. And it would be so comfortable to have you for a little while. Poor little soul. You look as if you'd grieved yourself half sick. I'm going to take care of you, so don't cry any more. For an hour, this new pair walked and talked, or rested on the wall, enjoying the sweet influences which give such a charm to time and place. And when an unromantic dinner bell warned them away, Amy felt as if she left her burden of loneliness and sorrow behind her in the chateau garden. At this moment, the pair was spied by Aunt March. Oh, look! Mr. Lawrence has arrived. Look at her face. The child has been pining for young Lawrence. Oh, bless my heart. I never thought of such a thing. Well, of course you didn't. Oh, be quiet, Estelle. In spite of the new sorrow, it was a very happy time. So happy that Laurie could not bear to disturb it by a word. One day, out on the lake, in a little two-boat, Amy had been dabbling her hand in the water, and during a pause that fell between them, she looked up, 
Lar was leaning on his oars, looking at her with an expression in his eyes that made her cheeks blush. You must be tired. Rest a little and let me row. It will do me good, for since you came I have been altogether lazy and luxurious. I'm not tired, but you may take an oar if you like. There is room enough, though I have to sit nearly in the middle else the boat won't trim. Oh well, we pull together, don't we? So well, that I wish we might always pull in the same boat. Will you, Amy? Yes, Lori. Why don't you write? That always used to make you happy. I've no heart to write. And if I had, nobody cares for my things. We do. Write something for us, and never mind the rest of the world. Try it, dear. I'm sure it would do you good and please us very much. Don't believe I can. Despite her misgivings, Jo sat down to try to write. And less than an hour passed before she was busy at her desk. Jo never knew how it happened, but something got into that story that went straight to the hearts of those who read it. For when her family had laughed and cried over it, her father sent it, much against her will, to one of the popular magazines. And to her utter surprise, it was not only paid for, but others requested it. Letters from several persons whose praise was honor followed the appearance of the little story. Newspapers copied it, and strangers as well as friends admired it. For a small thing, it was a great success. And Jo was more astonished than when her novel was commended and condemned all at once. I don't understand it. What can there be in a simple little story like that to make people praise it so? There is truth in it, Jo. That's the secret. You wrote with no thoughts of fame and money and put your heart into it. You have had the bitter. Now comes the sweet. If there is anything good or true in what I write, it isn't mine. I owe it all to you and father and Beth. So taught by love and sorrow, Jo wrote her stories and enjoyed the sweet. Amy and Lavi wrote of their engagement. It was sort of a written duet, wherein each glorified the other in lover-like fashion. Very pleasant to read and satisfactory to think of, for no one had any objection to make. Are you happy, mother? Yes. I hoped something like this would happen. Ever since Amy wrote that she had refused Fred, I felt sure then that something better than what you call the mercenary spirit had come over her. And a hint here and there in her letters made me suspect that love and Laurie would win the day. How sharp you are, Marmy. And how silent. You never said a word to me. Well, I didn't want to put the idea into your head, lest you should write and congratulate them before the thing was settled. I'm not the scatterbrain I was. You may trust me. I'm sober and sensible enough for anyone's confidant now. So you are, my dear, and I should have made you mine. Only I fancied it might pain you to learn that your teddy loves someone else. Now, mother, did you really think I could be so silly and selfish after I'd refused his love? There's some post. One for you, Joe, and I believe a letter from Amy. Read it out, Marmy. I want to hear all about her adventures. You don't have to do that, Joe. I truly want to hear about her. Dearest Mother, it is so, so beautiful, beautiful to be, to be loved, loved as Laurie loves, loves me. me. He isn't sentimental, but I see and feel it in all he says and does. And it makes me so happy and so humble that I don't seem to be the same girl I was. I never knew how good and generous and tender he was till now, for he lets me read his heart, and I find it full of noble impulses and hopes and purposes, and I'm so proud to know it's mine. Oh, mother, I never knew how much like heaven this world could be when two people love and live for one another. Oh, Amy, truly love does work miracles. How very, very happy they must be. Who's your letter from? I'm not sure. I'm not expecting anything. Oh, that's from Professor Bear. 
The scrap of paper could hardly be called a letter, for it only had one sentence on it. But it was worth pages of scribblings to Joe as she read it. Wait for me, my friend. I may be a little late, but I shall surely come. He's so kind, so good, so patient with me always, my dear old Fritz. I didn't value him half enough when I had him, but now how I should love to see him. For everyone seems to be going away from me, and I'm all alone. You're never alone, my girl. An old maid, that's what I'm to be. A literary spinster. I dare say old maids are very comfortable when they get used to it, but... But Joe couldn't continue the sentence, as the prospect was not inviting. It seldom is at first, and thirty seems the end of all things to five and twenty. But it's not as bad as it looks, and one can get on quite happily if one has something in oneself to fall back upon. Don't laugh at spinsters, dear girls, for often very tender... Tragic romances are hidden away in the hearts that beat so quietly under the sober gowns, and many silent sacrifices of youth, health, ambition, love itself make the faded faces beautiful in God's sight. Remember that rosy cheeks don't last forever, that silver threads will come in bonny brown hair, and that by and by... Kindness and respect will be as sweet as love and admiration now. But back to Joe, Sitting alone in her garret, waiting for something, anything, to bring her out of this slump. It's as if you haven't moved. My Teddy! Oh, my Teddy! Dear Joe, you were glad to see me then. Glad? My blessed boy, words can't express my gladness. Where's Amy? Your mother has got her, down at Meg's. We stopped there, by the way, and there was no getting my wife out of their clutches. Your what? Now I've done it. You've gone and got married? Actually married? Very much so. Thank you. Mercy on us. What dreadful thing will you do next? A characteristic, but not exactly complimentary, congratulation. What can you expect when you take one's breath away, creeping in like a burglar and letting cats out of bags like that? Come on, you ridiculous boy, and tell me all about it. Don't I look like a married man and the head of a family? Not a bit, and you never will. You've grown bigger and bonnier, but you are the same scoundrel as ever. Now, really, Joe, you ought to treat me with more respect. (laughs) How can I, when the mere idea of you married and settled is so irresistibly funny that I can't keep sober? How did you ever get Anne to agree? It was hard work, but between us, we talked her over, for we had heaps of good reasons on our side. There wasn't time to write and ask leave, but you all liked it, had consented to it by and by, and it was only taking time by the fetlock, as my wife says. Aren't we proud of those two words, and don't we like to say them? (laughs) (laughs) A trifle, perhaps. She's such a captivating little woman, I can't help being proud of her. When? Where? How? Six weeks ago, at the American Consuls in Paris. A very quiet wedding, of course, for even in our happiness we didn't forget dear little Beth. Why didn't you let us know afterward? We wanted to surprise you. We thought we were coming directly home at first, but the dear old gentleman, as soon as we were married, found he couldn't be ready under a month at least, and sent us off to spend our honeymoon wherever we liked. Amy had once called Val Rosa a regular honeymoon home, so we went there. Joe, can I ask a favor of you? Of course. Can we go back to the happy old times when we first knew one another? Teddy, we never can be boy and girl again. The happy old times can't come back, and we mustn't expect it. I shall miss my boy, but I shall love the man as much and admire him more because he means to be what I hoped he would. We can't be little playmates any longer, but we will be brother and sister, to love and help one another all our lives, won't we, Laurie? He did not say a word, but took the hand she offered him and laid his face down on it for a minute, feeling that out of the grave of a boyish passion 
there had risen a beautiful, strong friendship to bless them both. In trooped the whole family, and everyone was hugged and kissed all over again, and after several vain attempts, the new husband and wife were set down to be looked at and exalted over. Love has done much for our little girl. She's had a good example before her all her life, my dear. You must be my girl now. Help stop me from getting too grouchy. I'll try to fill her place, sir. Daisy, what do you think of Aunt Amy's dress? She looks like a princess. Doesn't she just... Thank you, little one. It was always Meg who played the princess in your play. (laughs) Yes, and look at me now. Still as regal as ever. (laughs) Oh, you flatterer. Is that the door? I'll go. She opened the door with hospitable haste and started as if a ghost had come to surprise her. For there stood a tall, bearded gentleman, beaming on her from the darkness like a midnight sun. Oh, Mr. Bear, I am so glad to see you. And I to see Miss March, but no, you have a party. No, we haven't, only the family. My sister and friends have just come home, and we're all very happy. Come in and make one of us. If you are sure I shan't be a burden, I will so gladly see them all. You have been ill, my friend. Not ill, but tired and sorrowful. We have had trouble since I saw you last. Ah, yes, I know. My heart was sore for you when I heard that. Father, Mother, this is my friend, Professor Bear. Welcome. Do come in, Professor. While Laurie and Amy were taking conjugal strolls over velvet carpets, setting their house in order and planning a blissful future, Mr. Bear and Joe were enjoying promenades of a different sort, along muddy roads and sodden fields. For a fortnight, the Professor came and went with lover-like regularity. Then he stayed away for three whole days, and made no sign, a proceeding which caused almost everybody to look sober, and Joe to become pensive at first, and then, alas, for romance, very cross. Disgusted, I dare say, and gone home as suddenly as he came. It's nothing to me, of course, but I should think he would have come and bid us goodbye like a gentleman. Well, I'm going on my own, then. You'd better take the little umbrella, dear. It looks like rain. Yes, Marmy. Do you want anything in town? I've got to run in and get some paper. Yes, I want a paper of number nine needles. Have you got your thick boots on and something warm under your cloak? I believe so. If you happen to meet Mr. Bayer, bring him home for tea. Yes, I quite long to see the dear man. Jo positively stomped to the town, and in her frustration left her umbrella in the stationery shop. Only when a droplet of rain fell on her nose was she bored of her thoughts. As the rain began to pour, she ran for shelter and straight into the arms of the professor. You have no umbrella. May I go also and take for you the bundles? We thought you had gone. Do you believe that I should go with no farewell to those who have been so heavenly kind to me? No, I I didn't. I knew you were busy about your own affairs, but we rather missed you. Father and mother especially. And you? I'm always glad to see you, sir. Likewise. I am always pleased to see you. I shall miss you so when I have to leave. So you are leaving? Unfortunately, yes. I have been offered a job teaching on the West Coast. So far away. Joe picked up her umbrella and the pair walked in heavy silence through the woods to the march home. For now the sun seemed to have gone in as suddenly as it came out, and the world grew muddy and miserable again. For the first time she discovered that her feet were cold, her head ached, and that her heart was colder than the former, fuller of pain than the latter. Mr. Bear saw the drops on her cheeks, though she turned her head away. Hearts, dearest, why do you cry? Because you are going away. That is wonderful, Joe. I have nothing but much love to give you, and I came to see if I was something more than a friend. Am I? Oh, yes. What made you stay away so long? It was not easy, but I could not find the heart to take you from that happy home until I could have a prospect of one to give you after much time, perhaps, and hard work. How could I ask you to give up so much for a poor fellow who has no fortune but a little learning? I'm glad you were poor. I couldn't bear a rich husband. Don't fear poverty. I've known it long enough to lose my dread and be happy working for those I love. You give me such hope and courage, and I have nothing to give back but a full heart and these empty hands. Not empty now.
and stooping down, she kissed her Friedrich under the umbrella. That was the crowning moment of both their lives, when turning from the night and storm and loneliness to the household light and warmth and peace waiting to receive them. Welcome home, Friedrich. For a year, Jo and her professor worked and waited, hoped and loved, met occasionally, and wrote huge volumes of letters practically every day. The second year began rather soberly, for the prospects did not brighten. And Aunt March died suddenly. But when the first sorrow was over, for they loved the old lady in spite of her sharp tongue, they found they had cause for rejoicing. She had left Plumfield to Joe, which made all sorts of joyful things possible. It's a fine old place, and we'll bring a handsome sum, for of course you intend to sell it. No, I don't. You don't mean to live there. Yes, I do. I want to open a school for boys and girls, a good, happy, home-like school with me to take care of them and Fritz to teach them. That is a truly Joeyan plan for you. I like it. So do I. It will take a lot of work, Joe. Joe can do it and be happy in it. It's a splendid idea. Tell us all about it. I knew you'd stand by me, sir. I told my plan to Fritz, and he said it was just what he would like, and agreed to try it when we get rich. Bless his dear heart. He's been doing it all his life. Helping people, I mean, not getting rich, that he'll never be. But now, thanks to my good old aunt, who loved me better than I ever deserved. I'm rich. At least I feel so, and we can live at Plumfield perfectly well if we have a flourishing school. It's just the place for children. The house is Big and splendid grounds outside. Think what luxury. Plumfield, my own. And a wilderness of children to enjoy it with me. But may I inquire how you intend to support the establishment? If all the pupils are little ragamuffins, I'm afraid your crop won't be very profitable, Mrs. Bear. Now don't be a wet blanket, Teddy. Of course, I shall have rich pupils also. Perhaps begin with such altogether. Then, when I've got a start, I can take in a ragamuffin or two, just for relish. Rich people's children often need care and comfort as well as poor. It was a very astonishing year altogether, for things seemed to happen in an unusually rapid and delightful manner. Almost before she knew where she was, Jo found herself married and settled at Plumfield. Then a family of six or seven children sprung up like mushrooms and flowered surprisingly, poor as well as rich, for Mr. Lawrence was continually finding some touching case of destitution and begging the bears to take pity on the child, and he would gladly pay a trifle for its support. Yes, Jo was a very happy woman there, in spite of hard work, much anxiety, and a perpetual racket. She enjoyed it heartily, and found the employs of her boys more satisfying than any praise of the world. For now, she told no stories except to her flock of enthusiastic believers and admirers. As the years went on, two little lads of her own came to increase her happiness. Rob, named for Grandpa, and Teddy, a happy-go-lucky baby who seemed to have inherited his papa's sunshiny temper as well as his mother's lively spirit. There were a great many holidays at Plumfield, and one of the most delightful was the yearly apple picking, for then the Marches, Lawrences, Brooks, and Bears turned out in full force and made a day of it. Five years after Joe's wedding, one of these fruitful festivals occurred, a mellow October day, when the air was full of an exhilarating freshness which made the spirits rise and the blood dance healthily in the veins. Everybody declared that there had never been such a perfect day or such a jolly set to enjoy it, and everyone gave themselves up to the simple pleasures of the hour as freely as if there were no such things as care or sorrow in the world. Jo was in her element that day and rushed about with her gown pinned up and her hat anywhere but on her head, and her baby tucked under her arm, ready for any lively adventure which might turn up. At four o'clock, a lull took place, and baskets remained empty, while the apple-pickers rested and compared rents and bruises. 
then joe and meg with a detachment of the older children set forth the supper on the grass for an out-of-door tea was always the crowning joy of the day a toast to aunt march god bless her now all the children wanted to wish grandma a very happy 60th birthday long life to her with three times three we filled a wheelbarrow with all your gifts grandma oh how wonderful how spoiled i am when mrs march had tried to thank her children she was overcome with tears as little teddy wiped her eyes on his pinafore the professor suddenly began to sing. Then, from above him, voice after voice took up the words, and from tree to tree echoed the music of the unseen choir as the children of Plumfield sang with all their hearts the little song that Joe had written, Laurie set to music, and the professor trained his pupils to give with the best effect. I don't think I ever ought to call myself Unlucky Joe again, when my greatest wish has been so beautifully gratified. And yet your life is very different from the one you pictured so long ago. Do you remember our castles in the air? Yes, I remember. But the life I wanted then seems selfish, lonely, cold to me now. I haven't given up hope that I may write a good book yet, but I can wait. And I'm sure it will be all the better for such experiences and illustrations as these. My castle was the most nearly realized of all. I asked for splendid things, to be sure, but in my heart I knew I should be satisfied if I had a little home and John and some dear children like these. I got them all, thank God, and I'm the happiest woman in the world. My castle is very different from what I planned, but I would not alter it. Though, like Joe, I don't relinquish all my artistic hopes or confine myself to helping others fulfill their dreams of beauty, I've begun to model a figure of baby Beth, and Laurie says it is the best thing I've ever done. I think so myself, and mean to do it in marble, so that, whatever happens, I may at least keep the image of my little angel. As Amy spoke, a great tear dropped on the golden hair of the sleeping child in her arms. For her one well-beloved daughter was a frail little creature, and the dread of losing her was the shadow over Amy's sunshine. She is growing better, I am sure of it, my dear. Don't despond, but hope and keep happy. I never ought to, while I have you to cheer me up, Marmy, and Laurie to take more than half of every burden. He never lets me see his anxiety, but is so sweet and patient with me so devoted to Beth, and such a stay and comfort to me always that I can't love him enough. None of us could have had these charmed lives if it wasn't for you, Mother. Here, here. Without you helping us along the way, who knows where we'd be. I hope the coming years bring more happiness for you, Marmy. Touched to the heart, Mrs. March could only stretch out her arms as if to gather children and grandchildren to herself and say, with face and voice full of motherly love, gratitude, and humility. Oh, my girls, I never can wish for greater happiness than this. Chapter 4 of Little Women was adapted, edited, and directed by Zoe Thomas Webb with music composed by Dominic Pollard and Scott Killick. For this chapter, the cast included Kirsty Harrison as Jo, Paula Mount as Meg, Alex O'Donnell as Amy, Lexi Milligan as Beth, Sarah Perkins as Marmy, Tom Thornton as Mr. March, Will Fallsworth as Laurie, Nick Mouton as Mr. Lawrence, Jonathan Grant as Mr. Brooke, Adam Mulder as Fred Vaughan, Ellie Meacham as Kate Vaughan, Penny Wetherill as Aunt March, Josie Murphy Harding as Florence, Ali Stadden as Estelle, Sarah Kitchen as Hannah, Ben Clare as Professor Bear, Jim Dixon as Demi, Dorothy Golding as Daisy, and Catherine Goddard as Louisa.